Today on Timescast, why AOL wants the Huffington Post. 300 million bucks for a five-year-old website. A government clinic in Vancouver helps drug users inject safely, curbing high rates of HIV. And opinion columnist Thomas L. Friedman from Tahrir Square. This is the most remarkable thing I have ever seen. On Monday, AOL announced plans to buy the Huffington Post for $315 million. David, the Huffington Post today is calling this a brand new media universe. Uh, why did AOL have to come in, swoop in, and buy the Huffington Post? I mean, part of it is a great American success story, right? Ariana Huffington, I think we all sort of giggle a little bit when she got together with her celebrity friends and launched a blog. Isn't that cute? Isn't that funny? And here we are five years later, Ariana demonstrating the ability to generate growth. You know, got, got it up to like 20, 25 million right. unique visitors a month. It's a great country where you can build out <laughs> something that quick. And they signed the deal at the Super Bowl just to etch its Americanness. Yeah, this, this website here on the Huffington Post today shows a constellation of brands, all these disparate brands that the two are going to be bringing together. Is one of the risks for AOL and for Huffington Post that they don't all obviously fit together into a puzzle? What AOL had trouble with is people don't go to a portal anymore for uh, content. They go to a particular sensibility or an ideology. Right. Like, like Ariana's. The, like Ariana's. You know, she has a very defined political perspective and people identify with it. When it becomes part of a big blob of media, you kind of wonder what brand is going to come out on top and why people will be going there. And famously, Huffington Post has a lot of people doing all the work for free, right? Yeah, it's like Tom Sawyer where he shows them how to paint the fence and they, they all <laughs> paint the fence for free. Today is a day where the price of web content got established, right? 300 million bucks for a five-year-old website. And so web content has value, except a lot of the people who did it, who created that content, did it for free. So there's a very mixed message. I mean, what they're paying for is almost aggregation, more so than real reporting. It's probably not a great day for those of us who type for a living. In a preview of a story in Tuesday's Science Times, Vancouver, British Columbia has reversed a rising HIV rate with a clinic offering clean drug injections for addicts. It's the only facility of its kind in North America. Alfonso Velez narrates this story, reported by Donald McNeil and Ed O. By offering clean needles, aggressive testing, and treating those who may be infected with HIV, Insight is showing that widespread treatment can protect the whole community against the spread of AIDS. The number of new infections in British Columbia has dropped 52% over the last 13 years. The reason Insight came about was due to an alarming spike, if you will, in the amount of overdose deaths in um, British Columbia. Now, at the same time, researchers estimated that the rate of HIV infection amongst this population was between 20 and 30%. That is like a developing country in Africa. You know, that's, that's way off the charts. But the clinic is controversial because it provides a safe haven for drug users. It has also provoked fears of increased crime and drug use in the community. A lot of people think that um, if you give someone a needle, that they're automatically just going to use more. And we know that's not true. People are going to use drugs whether they have clean equipment or they don't. My brother died of AIDS-related kidney failure, and he got it from sharing needles and not having a place like Insight to go and do it cleanly. Because people get high, they don't care, right? And that's just what happened, right? This is Tom Friedman. I'm the foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times. I'm here in Tahrir Square in Cairo. I've been covering this region now for, you know, traveling here for 40 years. This is the most remarkable thing I have ever seen. This is the single most authentic expression of Arab aspiration, hope, frustration, uh, culture, identity that I have ever seen anytime, anywhere. Somebody broke open a fire hydrant here and the real Egypt in, in all its energy, passion and hopes is just gushing out here. I know there's a lot of talk back in the States about what is the realistic thing we do. Some say support Mubarak, you know, some say not. All I can tell you is what you see behind me here is the new realism. 
whatever policy we make in the Middle East better be based on what's going on back here, which is an authentic expression of hopes and aspirations of Egyptians, and I would say even Arabs, to own their countries. What's critical now, though, is that this group, this gathering, can find a leadership and find a common political platform so they can negotiate with the existing authorities in order to create a real constitutional framework to take all the energy here and give it a political shape that can actually guide Egypt in the 21st century. That's my hope, but believe me, the new realism is right back there. Join us again tomorrow for Timescast.